Hello, good evening. How is everyone? So we're here with Astronomy on Tap Bonn, virtually. Uh, we hope you guys are well and watching us from home here with Astronomy uh, on Tap Bonn, virtually. We wanted to say that uh, because of the restrictions uh, of uh, COVID-19, we had to switch to this uh, version, to this mode of um, bringing you astronomy. Uh, so instead of fiddlers, uh, today we are at home. It's of us uh, in their own home uh, and connecting via Skype. We're going to discuss a lot about astronomy and we are very sorry we are not at Fiddler's and we hope to be there back soon, hopefully in April. And we have a fantastic event arranged for you today. First, uh, I will introduce the team. We have uh, with us uh, Lila, who is taking care of all the technical things and will take it, will be taking care of the um, live chat. So if you have questions during the live stream, please write them down and we will answer them. Uh, we have Felix, he will moderate the second part of the live uh, mode, Kevin, Sven. Uh, members that could not be with us uh, today, but I'm sure they're watching us uh, from their couch and having a beer and dinner. Uh, is Sandra, Florian, Anna, Toma, and Manali. And our special guest uh, of the day is Dr. Alvaro Sanchez Monge. I hope I said it right. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have an interview of uh, Dr. Alvaro. Very, very nice interview about star formation. We'll go to that in a minute. But uh, before we start, let's meet the team, right? So... I'll go last. Uh, let's start with Lila. Lila, tell us a bit uh, about yourself. Introduce us yourself. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Lila. I'm a PhD student at the Argelanda Institute um, of the University of Bonn. And I am studying uh, how we can detect dark matter in the universe with gravitational lensing. Fantastic. So let's uh, now go to Felix. Yes, hi everyone, I'm Felix, so you might uh, have seen me moderating astronomy on tap if you have been to one of our live events. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, basically next to Fiddler's, <laughs> and I'm studying their uh, active galactic nuclei and especially their, uh, their jets at very small scales. And in my third year, so should finish soon. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. We hope you do, and uh, I really like that research. Uh, I'm a bit biased. So let's go to Maud. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Maud. Uh, I started my PhD at the Agerlanda Institute uh, in Bonn in Germany uh, one year ago, pretty much exactly. <laughs> um, and I'm working on the Sanyev Zadovich effect. Uh, more about that later, probably. <laughs> Great. Uh, happy anniversary. Uh, mode. <laughs> uh, then let's go to Kevin. Hi everybody, so I'm also a PhD student at the University of Bonn and uh, I work with uh, radio observations and observations in the submillimeter and millimeter looking at the gas and dust and the formation processes for uh, stellar evolution across cosmic time. So particularly, particularly looking at distant starbursting galaxies. Okay, that sounds fantastic, and uh, we'll learn more about star formation in a bit. Let's go to Sven, please. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Sven. I'm a PhD student also at the Argelana Institute, and basically I'm trying to find new methods to analyze the existing data sets that we have, because we have lots of data, um, and yeah. Fantastic, thank you very much. and. Uh, this is, uh, oh, me, I forgot myself. Okay, uh, <laughs> I am Eleni, I'm a postdoc researcher, uh, the founder and manager of Astronomy on Tap Bonn. Uh, and I'll say a few words, Astronomy on Tap Bonn is a satellite um, of Astronomy on Tap, which started in New York in 2013. Um, parenthesis. So I study active galaxies, I, I use radio, infrared, optical observations to understand their nature and how they affect their host and uh, environment uh, and 
in general, uh, how they affect galaxy evolution. So, let's go to our special guest of the day, Dr. Alvaro Sanchez Monge. Um, great. So, thank you very much for being with us uh, today, Alvaro. Um, Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a different setting from the original we had uh, imagined, uh, you know, in a pub with a lot of people. Uh, but, um, okay, this didn't work out, but I think we're going to have very good time tonight, have fun. And uh, I want you to tell us a few things about yourself. Um, I mean, who are you? Introduce yourself to us. So my name is Alvaro, as you said. So I, I was born in Spain and now I'm working here in Germany, in Cologne, especially, so not in Bonn. So I'm at the university. I'm a scientific researcher. So I finished my PhD some time ago and I moved to different parts in the world. And finally, I ended up being here. And my research is mainly star formation. So I, I want to understand how stars, the stars like the ones that we can see in the night, so how are they formed? Fantastic. You said you you went to different places around the world. Where did you move? So, I, so I'm so i from a small village close to Barcelona, a small city. I should say city is not a village, but just to make sure that no one gets upset with me if they see this. <laughs> um, and I stayed in Barcelona. I did my physics degree there and my PhD, but part of my PhD was also done in Mexico, in a city that is called Morelia at the center of Mexico. And after that, so I moved for a couple of years to Florence in Italy, a really nice city. It's a pity the situation that we have now with the coronavirus, but I hope everything will get back to normal soon. And then after that time there in Florence, I moved here to, to Cologne. So I was probably tired of the good weather and good food in <laughs> Southern Europe, and I decided to move to the north of Europe, yes, to enjoy <laughs> the rain. <laughs> but they have very nice beer here. That's true. Right? But I'm there drinking is... water now, so something is wrong with me. So. Something something is wrong, okay. But uh, it's okay. I will balance it out. I have a curls here. That's um, true. So mm -hmm. now it's okay. Um, fantastic. I, I really like how you traveled around and uh, you settled here uh, in uh, the beautiful uh, area of, uh, you know, outside Bonn, basically, right? I see. Yeah, I see. Outside, yeah. outside Bonn. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> good. So, tell us, uh, Alvaro, why did you choose astronomy in the first place? That's uh, yeah, an interesting question. And so, it's I would say it's hard to answer, but mm -hmm. probably I could go back when I was a kid. So, I'm probably all of us, we can go back to when we were kids. And I remember, so... So I'm from close to Barcelona, but my parents are from a village close to the city of Madrid, so in the center of Spain. And every summer and winter, we were going there for some weeks. And then I remember spending nights there, just laying in the floor, in the ground, watching the stars and bringing my grandmother outside to tell her, so ah, this star is that, this other star is whatever, so this constellation is that, so trying to guide her. And I think when I was growing up, then I had to take a decision at some point, and I had two different options. So one was going into astronomy, the other was doing paleontology or archaeology. So these were my two big uh, interests at that time. And I have to admit that, so to do astronomy, I had to study physics. To do archaeology, paleontology, I should go more in the direction of history or geology. And I'm a really big fan of history, of learning, uh, reading books and so on. But some, somehow, I don't know why I decided to go for the more scientific numerical aspect of my life. And I ended doing physics. And then since the beginning, I knew that I wanted to do astronomy when I started physics. And here I am. So, it's so instead of becoming Indiana Jones, you're Indiana Jones of the universe. Exactly. So, so I like hope that. <laughs> maybe something close to Han Solo, but I don't know if it's... <laughs> that's, that's nice. Why not? Uh, in the near future. No? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, fantastic. I think, as you said, every one of us has a story from our uh, child years related to why we chose astronomy. And 
I've talked to other people too. And uh, even myself, at some point, I wanted to become an archaeologist. And I think it's influenced from Indiana Jones. Exactly. Uh, I think Indiana yeah. Jones and Jurassic Park was the other kind of movies that were happening when I was a kid. And yes. I think this, this biased my, my way of thinking. Uh, but astronomy won. And, uh, you know, astronomy should be lucky because you are doing very amazing things, a lot of amazing things. And before we go into specifics uh, about um, the things you study and you know, uh, tell us a bit a typical day of an astrophysicist. What do you do at your work? So I would say, so first I probably should mention that for the people who do not know how astrophysicists work, so is that there are mainly two types, let's say. So one is the observers and the others are the theories or people working with numerical simulations. So, and I think the days, the working days of both of them are pretty similar with the difference that observers, we have the advantage that we can move around the world and go to really interesting places just to use the telescopes that they have there. So essentially the working day that I would have, so it could be divided either if I'm observing or if I'm working from the office. So if I'm, if I'm observing, I'm in a really remote place at the top of a mountain, isolated with no one. So it's like perfect. That was a perfect training for what we are doing now. So we are in isolation. So that was, yeah, idea. So, and, and yeah, the, the locations there are, are really amazing. So no contamination almost, no, no light in most of the cases. So you can enjoy the sky, the, the night sky. And you get to know how these big machines, these telescopes work. And, and this is something really, really interesting. So it's also exhausting because you have to spend many, many hours observing. So the day would be probably waking up at some time just to prepare the observing files that you need to, to execute in the telescope and then spending many hours in front of the telescope just trying to, to record data and then eating, sleeping, observing, eating, sleeping, observing. But it's a nice location. Then once you have this data, so I can move to my office and this would be the most of the time. So the kind of work that I have, so it's, I would say 90% of the time or 80% of the time. And it's, it could be said that I'm sitting in front of a computer analyzing all the data that I have processed. And then at the same time, so I spend many time, many hours with meetings, discussing with other people about the scientific results that we are encountering. So what to do next? So if we have found something interesting, so what does it mean? So can we try something new? So it's, it's brainstorming new ideas, scientific ideas, trying to solve the problems that we are facing. Then at, at the position that I'm now, so there are several students. So I also spend time supervising the students, which is also kind of scientific discussion because you can discuss with them what to do next or what they plan to do or what they are doing. So, and then also spending a couple of hours per day just answering emails. But I think this <laughs> happens to every kind of work in the world. But the, so the, the work, normal work day, it's meetings and scientific discussions and then working in front of the computer trying to understand what the telescope was recording. Uh, surely you have some time to read articles and... Uh... Sure. So, yeah, exactly. So, in, in, indeed, in order to understand or, or to decide what to do next, so, or in the scientific discussion, so, so we need to keep updated with new discoveries. And for this, so the publication that other people are publishing every day, so are quite relevant. So, this is what more or less guides all of us to, in the direction of, okay, so this group of people found this interesting thing, so can I find something similar that explains better the questions that they remain open? Or, okay, they found something, but it does not fit with what I know that should be happening, so can I find something that complements what they have and try to bring light to, to this scientific discussion that the whole world, so different groups are having with respect to one topic? So reading papers, I think it's also fundamental part of, of doing research. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really critical so for people starting in the beginning, so getting to be up to date with the new discoveries, I think it's quite important. And just and, and going to seminars, uh, 
in your institute and sure. conferences and talking to other scientists. And we are lucky as uh, astronomers because the observing telescopes are in nice places, Hawaii, Chile, uh -huh. uh, Canary Islands. Uh, also, our conferences are held in very nice places, Hawaii, <laughs> Chile. I think this is done to make sure that also the theories can go to nice places and not only the observers. So if you hold a conference in a nice place, so everyone can go there and enjoy it. Fantastic. Um, very, very good. Uh, so thank you for telling us a bit about your everyday life as an astronomer. And um, let's, talk, let's go to the science part mm -hmm. now. Uh, you work on uh, the process of formation of high mass stars. So tell us a bit about uh, high mass stars. What are they? Are they different from our sun? Hmm. You know, is it important yeah. to study them? So since I'm studying them, I should say, yeah, they are important to study. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so high mass stars are, so a star is, the sun is one of the stars that we have close by and we know really well. And there are many stars like our sun in terms of size, mass, luminosity. But there are other stars, they are less in number, but they are much bigger. So in terms of size, they can be 10 times or 100 times bigger. In terms of mass, they can be also 10 times or 100 times more massive than our sun. And in terms of luminosity, it can be up to 1 million times more luminous. So they are also, they, they have, and another different aspect with respect to the sun is that the process in which they life their, live their lives, it's slightly different, or the way they end their lives, let's say. Uh, the sun will at some point become what it's known as a red giant, so will become really large with an extension that will reach more or less the distance of the Earth or Mars, so it will become really big and cold, so red color, and at some point, what you will have inside is what is known a white dwarf. So essentially the nucleus of, of the sun will remain there. All the outer layers will disperse with that. For the most massive stars, this is different. So what you will have is that these stars at the end of their lives, they will explode a supernova and they can end being a neutron star or a black hole. So this is really different to what will happen to the sun. And so in the process of exploding as a supernova, so one of the interesting things is that many heavy elements will be formed. So elements like iron that are otherwise difficult to, to be formed, so will form in this supernova explosion. So essentially everything that we have around us, everything that we are somehow, was probably part or formed or produced in the supernova explosion of a massive star. So oh, massive stars are important. Ah, that's why they're so important, because without them, we wouldn't be here, basically. Exactly. Right? And uh, so this, uh, these chemicals like iron, uh, they don't happen, uh, they don't get produced inside the star before the explosion. They don't get produced by the nuclear reactions that happen. A, fra during a fraction can be produced. But then a relevant and important fraction is produced in this supernova explosion. So having them, it's quite relevant for them. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, you said that uh, they can either be a neutron star or uh, a black hole. Uh, and do we know when it's going to be a neutron star, star or a black hole? Does it depend on their mass? Or? Exactly. So if depending, so there are different ranges of masses. And so the most massive it is, so roughly speaking, the most massive it is, easier is to become a black hole. But it's not, this is not always the case because at some point, so during the evolution of the star, so there will be lots of winds and then part of the mass of the star will be ejected, will be exposed. And then the final mass that remains before the explosion in, into supernova, so may differ with respect to the original mass of the star. So then the, there are lots of models that can predict and say if the star has this mass or this mass, this will be a neutron star. If it has this range of masses, this will become a black hole. So this is pretty well modeled. Since we said models, uh, 
You said you are an observational uh, astrophysicist. Uh, do you also uh, use theoretical uh, predictions uh, to understand your data? And I why think is it this important? Is, I, I think this is a fundamental aspect. So if I was saying in the beginning that we, we observers, we have a good life going to nice locations and spending a good time at the telescopes, but without these theoretical models, we could do almost nothing because we need, so we can collect a lot of data. We can try to understand what we have in these images that we are recording with the telescopes, but we need to have a physical model that explains us what we are seeing. And theoretical models are doing this. So they are saying, okay, what happens if we put gravity or what happens if we include magnetic fields? Or what happens if we put a star here? Or So you put all these physical pieces, so all these pieces that contain physical information, and they can predict what will happen. Then once they have predicted this, we can compare with what we have observed in the telescope, and we can say, okay, what they predict and what we observe matches really well. So this means that our understanding, our theory, is correct. Most of the times what happens is that what the model predicts and what, what we observe do not match that well. Uh. And this is, I think this is good because this triggers more questions, more scientific questions like, okay, why this is not happening? So what do we need to do? Can we observe some things to better try to see how the model can be improved? Can we give some constraints to the model to, to improve it? So we need to have this constant communication between theory and observations to, to, to get to know what's going on. To understand nature eh? and uh, the physical mechanisms. And you mentioned telescopes. You study these objects in uh, many different wavelengths. Why? Why is it important to study so, um, at different wavelengths and not just, for example, in the optical, what the, the wavelengths we see? I would say the more information you can have, the better. But one important aspect is that not all the objects are equally bright at the different wavelengths. So, for example, the sun is really bright in the optical, so the, the light that we can see with our eyes. And then, in principle, with just, by just studying the sun in this wavelength regime, so in the optical regime, we could get to know many, many things. But then there are other objects that are not bright in the optical, either because they are obscure, they are, so their emission is uh, attenuated by something in front of them, and then we cannot detect them. And then we need to move to different wavelengths, so to different regimes of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in this case, so the kind of research that I'm doing, start, I'm trying to understand a star formation, so we have to go in the direction of not the optical, but going more to red wavelengths, let's say red colors, and then we go to the infrared, and then to something that is called far infrared, that it's lower frequency and higher wavelength, and then we go to something that it's a bit farther away, that it's millimeter, and then even something farther away that it's called centimeter. And this, so this regime, millimeter, centimeter, is what we usually call radio domain, because if you go to the wavelengths of centimeter or so, so the mobile phone, the radio, all these items that we have at home, they work with frequencies that are in this regime, in the centimeter, in the meter, in the millimeter domain. So we need to study these ranges to get to, to, get to know objects, objects, objects and that we can kind of see observe study, or study or in the optical. I think we lost you there uh, at the end. We had oh. a bit of a technical problem. Okay. So if I you can just it's... repeat uh, your last sentence. Yeah, okay. so I... I hope my internet connection is stable enough, so sorry for the problems. No, so I was just saying that oh, this last regime, the radio, it's really, re really relevant for the kind of study that I'm doing in star formation, because many objects that I want to study are not bright enough, do not emit radiation in the optical regime, so we need to observe them in this regime, in this millimeter, okay. centimeter. Um... And now I think I'm, I'm going to ask you a bit more about stars. I, I will leave the most interesting question at the end. Uh, but um, let's, let's talk a bit about uh, stars more. Where, where do they form in a, in a galaxy? 
Um, are they forming specific regions uh, and how do they form? So, if you Okay, so, so they are formed in some structures that we astronomers tend to call molecular clouds. And, and these molecular clouds, we can understand that they are like the clouds that we have in the sky, but much, much, much bigger. So their sizes are about 10 to 100 parsecs, that if we move it to kilometers, it's something like 10 to the 15 kilometers, more or less. So it's pretty, pretty large. And 10 to this, the 15, that's a very big number. This is a very big number. Uh, that 10 to the so, eight, to the 6 is a million, right? To exactly. the 9 is a billion, to the 12 is a trillion, so you can understand how big it is. It's pretty, pretty large. This is, in some sense, why we astronomers tend to not use these units of meters or kilometers or grams because otherwise we would have so huge numbers that it it could be hard to remember them or to to yeah operate with them easily if you want to do a quick calculation. And then we move to other units, like what I mentioned before, this parsec distance. And no, that's and not the one they use, sorry to interrupt you, but that's no. not the one they, they use in Star Wars the definition of parsec, right? I, <laughs> we use it, we yeah, use it for distance and they use it for speed. Okay, yeah, some I think, super, I think if yeah, I they make use, a mistake. I, I think they use something, I don't know if in Star Wars or in Star Trek, I think they use one unit in the wrong way. Either it's a velocity and they use it as distance or it's distance and they use it as velocity. Yeah, so... Or it's, time, yeah. how or, how long it takes to do to go there, and they say parsecs, something like that. We should refresh our memory, watch more movies now that we have, you know, more freedom at home. <laughs> we have plenty of time of watching the movies now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. Please no, tell no. us more about how stars are formed. Yes, yeah, so th there are these molecular clouds. That essentially, are these huge objects, and they are floating let's say, or staying in the galaxy. And the galaxy is what we know as Milky Way. So in the sky, we can see this fringe of, of this reach of white dots. It's where most of the stars are located. But if you look at it from distance, so if we could do this, essentially the Milky Way is like a disk with something in the center. So in this disk, we have lots of these structures that I was calling uh, molecular clouds. And inside these molecular clouds, what we have is lots of molecules. This is why they are called molecular. And molecules, so the most abundant one is the hydrogen molecule, so two hydrogen atoms together. But then there are many other molecules that we can also study. So at some point, this cloud, due to gravity or due to some effect that probably may introduce some kind of uh, turbulence or instability, this cloud will start collapsing, collapsing, collapsing. The process is much more complicated than this, but essentially at some point, one of these parts will become really dense. And at the center of this dense structure, nuclear reactions can start and then a star is formed. So all this process of going from the cloud to the star, yeah, it's more complicated. So you will have the cloud that it's fragmenting into small pieces. So it can form many stars at the same time, not only one star, and then these stars can interact. The way the material is being transported from the cloud to the star can depend also a lot on, on the motions of the gas. So you can end having something that we call disks. So the material stays around the star for a time before it gets secreted or transported to the final point that it's the, the star. And this so this would be a simple... Sorry. Yes. Sorry, this re the, where you have these molecular clouds are in the disk of the galaxy. Are there everywhere in the disk, uh, even closer to the nucleus, uh, or further out? How do they? So they. So going back to this description of the galaxy as a disk with a nucleus in the center. So the disk has several that we call spiral arms. Mm -hmm. Probably we can find many of these pictures uh, in the internet. So most of these molecular clouds are located along these spiral arms in the galaxy. And then when you go to the center, the center of our galaxy is a really interesting, chaotic, and probably not so well understood region, just because it's a little bit farther away than other regions in our galaxy. And because the gravity, so the 
the the effects or how gravity is working there. So it's it's gravity is normal, but you have many more effects that are making the motions of the material there to to behave not as smoothly as in the rest of the disk. You can still have really large clouds, and indeed the most massive, the biggest clouds, are really close to the center of the galaxy. Very interesting. Um, so do all galaxies have gas where they form stars from? Not uh, nowadays. Yeah, not nowadays. Okay. So our galaxy has it, has it lot of this gas. We could ask for a Kevin to know how these galaxies were before because this is part of what he is studying. But so there are other galaxies that we can see also nowadays that called elliptical. Before I was saying that our galaxy is a star galaxy. It's a disk with a nucleus and a but others are called elliptical because they are more like an ellipsoid, it's like the elongated. And these stars are older, are more evolved than, these galaxies, sorry, are older, more evolved than the galaxy where we are living, the, the Milky Way, and they do not have gas anymore. So there are no molecular clouds. So these galaxies are not forming stars. So only on galaxies like ours or others that are also a little bit irregular in shape, mm -hmm. contain a lot of gas and then can form stars. Okay, that's that's very interesting. So we live in a galaxy that is very alive and it's forming stars, <laughs> right? And you also said that there is a, a disk around the star that is being formed. Uh, this uh, accretion uh, disk that, that creates matter. And uh, is this how planets might get formed eventually, right? Uh, Ex exactly. So this, this, so... When I was summarizing the process of formation of the stars, I wanted to emphasize the presence of the disk because this is one of the key um, objects, let's say, in the star formation process that allows planets to exist in some sense. So the disk is a structure, it's the material that has been compressed or collected towards the center, does not go directly to the star, but remains around the star in a flattened structure that it's what we call disk. And this disk, so over time, material will flow in the direction of the star, but another part of the mass that is containing the disk will remain at, in this location. And the, so the material that I was mentioning before that are mainly molecules in this molecular cloud are not only molecules, but they are also tiny pieces of dust that we call dust grains. It's like the dust that we have at home and every weekend we have to clean, but much smaller. Okay. And these are, so the, they remain there. And then these small pieces that are a few hundred micrometers, they can start colliding one with the other. And then under good conditions, they can start sticking, becoming bigger, bigger, bigger. They will become something like a few meter size. Then at some point, they can collide with other meter size objects to something more like 100 meter size or so, and we will start reaching something that it's called planetesimals. So it's like the small bodies, the precursors of the planets. And finally, you will have all these species that will collide all together and can end forming what we know as a planet. Wow. So this disk is the location where planets are forming. That is fantastic. So if I leave the dust in my house and I don't clean it, will it form a planet? <laughs> we could try it. We could try it. Okay. Probably okay. It will not. So, so here, here we have the gravity that will make all the dust to go to the floor, to to the ground. And the other thing is that the time scale to form planets is mm -hmm. usually about one million years. So we could wait one million years okay. without cleaning the house, and let's see what happens. So maybe we have planets. Well, there. you know, this is how long it feels that we have been in this quarantine, so maybe, Probably, maybe yeah. planets will form. Um, but I wanted to ask a, a couple of things about uh, this disk. Why? Uh, why is it a disk? Why do we get this? You said this molecular cloud is more like a big cloud, right? Like an ellipse, uh, like an egg kind of um, shape. Why do we get this disk at the end? Essentially, is so the cloud is not something that remains 
it's a static and then it collapses, mm -hmm. but it's feeling the forces of the galaxy. So since the galaxies are rotating, so the disk of the galaxy is moving around, this cloud is also moving around, and then this can trigger some kind of rotation in the, in the cloud. So the cloud is not staying static, but it will be rotating. Then when you have uh, an object that is really large, that it's rotating, and you start compressing it, what will happen is that it will rotate faster, faster, faster. So it's like the uh, these people that are doing ice skating mm -hmm. in the Olympic Games or so, in the Winter Olympic Games. And then if they have the arms open, so they are big, they rotate really slow. When they put the arms really close, they rotate really fast. So this is the same thing that happens in when this cloud or is becoming smaller. And then at some point, so once you have something rotating really fast, the material that it's going to the center will not go directly to the center, but will preferentially go, just because of this rotation, will accumulate in a disk plane. So you have the, the material that's rotating that cannot flow directly to the center, but it's moved around and gets trapped, let's say, in, in the disk. So in, in the plane that it's perpendicular to the rotation axis of the cloud. Fantastic. Uh, so how can we detect this disk where planets uh, are going to be formed? Uh, do we detect them also with uh, the wavelengths you observe, the frequencies you observe that? Indeed, I would say that the best wavelengths to observe these disks are the millimeter domain, the millimeter <laughs> centimeter, because these objects, so this, this cloud that I was saying, I was mentioning that there are molecules and dust. So the dust is absorbing all the radiation in the optical. This is why we cannot see anything inside this cloud in the optical. And we need to go to other wavelengths. And in the millimeter domain, we can see that the radiation, that the dust particles are emitting. So in this wavelength domain, we can study dust. And then what we can do is try to identify, so if we know that the disk seen H1 should be a plane, so we can search for elongated structures at the location of where stars are forming. And then if we see this kind of elongated features, we can say, okay, this can be a disk. Other way, so if we see the disk face on, so what we will tend to see is a circular disk. And there was a recent image that Alma reported a couple of years ago of one of these disks seen almost face on with lots of features and rings. This is one of these disks where planets can be forming. Wow, that is fascinating that we can see with Alma this detail so far away in, uh, you know, in another star system, basically, right? How, how far away is it from us? If you can remind us uh, sure. a bit. Uh, so so this, this one that was uh, reported by Alma is, is a star that is called HL Tau. And Tau means that it belongs to the constellation Taurus. Mm. or to the molecular cloud Taurus. And this molecular cloud, the, it's the Taurus molecular cloud, is at a distance of about 140 parsecs. So it's at about something like 10 to the 16 kilometers away from us. So it's pretty far away, but it's one of the closest star-forming places to, to the Earth. So it's far, but it's close in comparison with all the other regions. So by watching, uh, observing, these uh, systems, we can understand how planets were formed in our solar system, correct? Uh -huh. Exactly. And, and we can uh, search also maybe for planets that have life. Uh, that would be the, the way to go. Pro probably, so all astronomers or all people doing astronomy, so if you really ask what is what you want to answer in reality, so if you pull, pull, pull the string, pray all of us, we will end saying we want to understand life. And then to understand life, so we know that life exists in, in our planet, and our planet seems to be something peculiar compared to the other planets in our solar system. So we want to know why our planet has life, but not the remaining seven or eight planets if we include Pluto. And Thank you that you included Pluto. I also like him as a yeah. planet. <laughs> I'm I'm okay with having him outside, but since yeah, since I was a kid, I was learning that Pluto was a planet, so I, I keep I keep him in mind. Uh, are and, the yeah. 
So are the systems, the other systems we're finding different? Uh, and, and how many planets we, we believe can be uh, hosting life? So for the moment, so these numbers are changing every day. But I think a few weeks ago or a few months ago, probably we were around 4,000 planets discovered outside our solar system. So our solar system has eight, nine planets, so we know 4,000 more. And these planets are distributed in, I think, in about 3,000 stellar systems or planetary systems. So this means that some systems, some stars, are already harboring more than one planet. In, and this means that the existence of stars with many planets, similar to what we know as the solar system, may be really common, pretty common. The problem is that we don't have still the telescopes or the techniques to detect them. So we can detect uh, planetary systems that are slightly different to the ones that, that where we are living. So in our plan, uh, solar system, we have the sun, we have tiny planets, the Earth is one of them, and then we have giant planets. So we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And we have some kind of clear distinction between small planets and giant planets. So most of these other planetary systems that we are finding, they have these giant planets really close to the star, so much closer than the Earth. And then this, this is telling us that, okay, these systems are really strange. Does it mean that our solar system is unique? No. This means that we are only able to detect planetary systems with these conditions, with big planets close to the star. Hopefully in the future with new telescopes, we will be able to start detecting more system, systems similar to the one where we are living. Nowadays, I think there are one or two that are pretty similar, so that they have also about four or five planets, and they are more or less located at similar distances, like the Earth, Neptune, uh, Mars, Venus, and so on. That's very interesting uh, what you're saying, because I don't think many people know this, that uh, we cannot detect solar systems like uh, our system, because we don't have the telescopes yet, uh, it doesn't mean that they don't exist out there. So maybe in the future we manage to find uh, a solar system like ours, and who knows, maybe life. But uh, exactly. maybe we can send a tweet there and, or broadcast this live show to that other planet. Yes, we are your friends. Don't come <laughs> to Earth; it has coronavirus. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I. You know, something uh, stuck in my head when you said that the center of our galaxy is a very peculiar place. Um, so I read somewhere that the center of our galaxy smells like raspberry and tastes like rum. And since we're doing astronomy on top bone, uh, I we think should go there. Right? <laughs> we should host the next one there. Okay. Um, so tell us a bit about the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, B2, and the neighborhood that it so, uh, uh, has so much gravity around it and it's so vibrant and interactive. So this, this is study that you were mentioning. So, it's, so the, the title is really uh, <laughs> nice uh, and, and it's a good way to reach the public that this is what we should do. So when we do science, we should make sure that what we learn, what we discover, reaches everyone outside, and not only the people that are working on this. And this study was done by uh, Arno Veloz, that is indeed a researcher in the Max Planck in Bonn, so pretty close to where you guys are or where you are working. And this was done a few years ago. And the reason is that we, so part of the research that we are doing when studying star formation is trying to search for molecules. A specific molecule. So when I was describing the molecular cloud, I was saying that most of the molecules that are there are this H2, molecular hydrogen. So two hydrogen atoms, one next to the other. But this is not the only molecule. We have many more molecules, and some of them can become pretty, pretty complex. And in the end, they can end forming what we know as amino acids, so the basis of life. So and this is what we are trying to do. So we are trying to search for this complex molecules, these big molecules that are the precursors of this life. And Arnaud, in, in this study, so he was studying this region called Sagittarius B2, 
Uh, I will explain later a little bit why this is so important in this region. And what we found is many lines, lines are features that indicate if a molecule is there or not. So it's like this QR code or this barcode that you have in all the items in the supermarket. But we can have this and depending on these bars, so we can say, okay, we have found three of them at these different positions. This belongs to this molecule or this belongs to this other molecule. And for the first time, he found a molecule that it's called uh, ethyl formate, that it's C2H5OCHO. So C is three carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen. And ethyl formate, it's relevant because all these ethyl alcohols are those that we have in the alcohol that we drink. <laughs> so the beer that you were having there, it's mainly ethanol plus some other alcohols. And then if you take this ethyl formate, this is the flavor that raspberries has and also the taste or the smell that rum has. Yeah, it's the also smell of a raspberry. It's the smell of raspberry and the taste of rum. Uh, so, also, I have to say yeah. that this same molecule mm -hmm. exists in the body of the ants, these insects. Wow. So, of course, it could be like eating raspberry or drinking rum <laughs> or eating ants. So it would be all okay. the same thing. I don't think this title would go very far. Exactly. <laughs> as a public they, they release. Pick the correct words to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, <laughs> you know, drinking rum and eating ants. <laughs> it's not so attractive yet. <laughs> no, no. Maybe not in Europe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in another place, <laughs> but not in Europe at least. Uh, so tell us. Uh, so it's very important study, right? We are finding chemicals and molecules that are responsible for life. And, yeah. uh, and this, this exists in the space inside our galaxy, in the space between stars, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and, so this region... Sorry, Alvaro, we are losing you. This is Can the you? most massive... Oh, okay. We lost you. Can is you it, please repeat? Is it working? Yes. Yeah, sure. Is it working again? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was saying that this region, Sagittarius B2, is the most massive, the largest cloud in the galaxy, the largest molecular cloud in the galaxy. And it has two particular subregions inside it where lots of star formation is happening. And this, so there is so much material there because it's so massive that it becomes easier to detect all these molecules. So we expect that all these molecules, like methyl formate, exist in many places in the galaxy, in all the star forming regions, but we cannot detect them because they're abundant. So the, the number of molecules of this type that exist, it's a little bit small. And then if you don't have many of them, you cannot see them. While in this region, in Sagittarius, it would... Okay, I think our connection uh, is not so good. And I there think, are many... Sorry, small. Alvaro, sorry to interrupt you. We lost you again for a moment. I think you were saying that it's important we have a big number of these uh, yeah. molecules in order to detect them. But in other regions in the galaxy, it's smaller numbers because the clouds are smaller, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So the densities and the masses are smaller and then there are less of these molecules and then it's a bit more difficult to detect them. So this is why the studies that, for example, are noted in this cloud, Sagittarius B2, are really important because this triggered many other studies in other clouds to search for similar molecules. And uh, that's good because we try to understand how life can be formed, uh, right? Uh, and everything, it, everything comes from stars, right? Exactly. Uh, um. Exactly. So we have all the elements are formed in the stars and then all these molecules at some point they will remain in this disk. Then they can get attached to these dust grains that are becoming bigger and bigger that are planets or in something smaller that are comets. So we expect these molecules to remain there. And then you just need to bring these molecules to the proper conditions to make them become amino acids. So precursors of life. So you just need to put them in the exact location within the disk to have life. Um, can you remind us why it's, uh, this cloud is so big in the center of uh, our galaxy? Yeah. It's special, as you said, right? Yeah. Does it have to do with the gravity being so 
So essentially, so yeah, in the center of, of our galaxy, we have an object that it's called Sagittarius A star, and it's a black hole. It's a really massive black hole. So it has one million times more mass than our sun. So it's pretty massive. And this influences all the neighborhood, the, the surroundings, with his gravity. So if you put a particle there, they will move attracted or strongly feeling the gravity that this black hole is, is generating. In addition to this, we have something that we call a bar. So the, the, our galaxy is not just a disk with the black hole in the center, but we have the disk, the black hole, and close to the black hole, we have something more elongated that we call bar. So the combination of this black hole plus the structure of the bar creates some gravity uh, forces that makes all the gas to move in some specific orbit, and, and then all the gas can accumulate at some specific portion in this orbit, making a really huge and big cloud. And this is what has happened with Sagittarius V2. So all the gas around it is moving around, and at some point it gets really accumulated or gathered in one position. This is a really massive object, and this is Sagittarius V2. Fantastic. Um, uh, okay, I think we covered a lot of uh, questions and we learned a lot of things about our, you know, about how stars are formed and um, all the nice things. Let's see if we have any questions about uh, from our live chat. Let me check here. Uh, guys from home, if you have questions, here's your chance. Uh, Alvar will be very happy to uh, answer everything because he's been doing it already very very well i uh, i mean it was very descriptive i think we have a very a better understanding of how stars are formed and uh, how planets are formed and that uh, dust can form planets in our house uh, if we wait uh, long enough and uh, <laughs> um sorry we have one question from so we have one question from the live chat the live stream which stars make which elements? Uh -huh. That's, so I'm not an expert on this topic. So if oh, so I it's say tricky. something okay, it's not, tricky. not hundred yeah. percent accurate, I will I will <laughs> point people to, to more expert people. But so essentially stars like our sun are really good at producing elements like hydrogen, uh, helium, uh, and then at some point getting back to carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. So let's say simple elements. And then in supernova explosions this is where you have a lot of energy and you can go to much heavier elements like iron. So you can go in, in this production of, of elements within stars or in the supernova, you can go up to iron. But so if you check carefully the reactions, the nuclear reactions that are happening inside any star, you can see that also in our sun, you can also produce a little bit of iron. So there, in all the stars, you can produce different fractions of all the elements, but in the supernova is where you can produce a relatively important and huge fraction of iron, or these more heavy elements, uh, considering the low number of such stars that exist in our galaxy. Uh, good. I, I can contribute to that, that uh, because I, very, I like that fact very much, that uh, we have... Uh, gold being created by not by stars by when stars collide and we're talking about neutron stars colliding so when you have two neutron stars colliding and uh, this is how we detected the gravitational waves and light so the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy it was when um, two uh, neutron stars collided and in the process gold was created so that's really good. Yeah, our precious, so our we, precious. <laughs> we, we should go to all these locations where neutron stars collide, bring our bags and make fill <laughs> them of gold, right? Well, we know we know two already. Okay. So yes, the first one in 2017, and uh, one I think it was announced this year. Uh, so pack your bags, and when we are allowed to leave our homes again, <laughs> we, we can, can go, go gold mining. <laughs> yes, we can go uh, gold mining. Um, uh, are there any more questions? Uh, 
Well, I have a question. I was going to leave it for the end. Uh, you talked to us about star uh, evolution of stars, so you, you covered this. But the other one you didn't cover is, um, and I don't know if you are an expert on this, but maybe you can say a few things. Do stars form outside the galaxy? Mm. So I have to say that I'm not an expert of anything, So, but I okay. just know a little bit of things. Uh, but So do stars form outside the galaxies? So in our current paradigm or theory of how stars are formed and how galaxies exist, one would say no, because you need to have uh, these clouds and they live within galaxies. However, there are things that we maybe do not know so correctly, and we know that there is material in between galaxies, so mainly uh, atomic gas, but you can have also pockets of molecular gas, so it could be that you can end forming some kind of stars there. Another thing that may be happening is that you have some stars that form more or less connected to a galaxy, and then they were ejected, and they are found now in between galaxies, or really distant from a galaxy, and then we could think, oh, is this a star that formed there, or it's coming from a different place? So this would be what I would say without being an expert on this topic, but... Very nice, very nice. I think uh, this opens more questions, but uh, th maybe for another time, uh, I would like to thank you very, very much for all the discussion, uh, the fantastic uh, discussion and answering to our questions. Uh, we learned a lot of things about stars and the center of our galaxy and about planets and molecules and uh, life. Um, and telescopes and how fancy astronomer li an astronomer's life is with traveling to all these nice places. Uh, we will have you with us until the end of uh, the live, but now we will change a bit. Uh, we will go to a panel discussion and Felix will take over and moderate this session where we're going to discuss casually some uh, topics that uh, interest us uh, at the moment. And uh, Felix, the floor, well, the mic is yours. Well, hello, everyone. So I hope that you can see me and that you can hear me. And, and he said already the, uh, about what we want to do now. And please uh, keep asking questions if uh, anything comes up, and we will try to answer them later. So uh, there are a few questions that we thought of that uh, might be interesting, even for us, but also for you. So um, one question, for example, that uh, Alvaro was already asked, so he already answered that, is what, what actually drives us here as astronomers uh, to do what we do? And why did we choose this path? And uh, I think everyone might have like a bit different answer to that. So, um, yeah, uh, for example, Eddie, why don't you start us off? How was that for oh, you? Oh, okay. Yes, I also wanted to be an archaeologist. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. But I, I think I agree with uh, most of the things that uh, Alvaro said. We have similar experiences also in Greece. The night sky is gorgeous, especially in the summer. And you fall in love with it, looking at the stars, you are in the beach, there is no light, and you want to learn more about the universe. So every kid wants to become an astronomer. Uh, and then during your uh, childhood, you change because you get a lot of influences from other things. And at that time, there was not so much influence in astronomy. So I want to become an archaeologist, I want to become a, a, a lawyer. Uh, which would uh, make me more money for sure, uh, <laughs> but That's also good. yeah. But then I saw a movie, you know, and this is a true story, guys. Uh, and uh, you hear it uh, first, okay? I I watched the movie where one of the actors, the leading actors, it was an actress and she was an astrophysicist. It was an action movie, uh, Chain Reaction with Keanu Reeves, and. It inspired me, and I started uh, uh, my direction towards physics. And once you start, uh, you know, taking that direction, astrophysics wins. It's my my personal experience. So astrophysics and action can combine. Absolutely. To something good. 
<laughs> yeah, there, there's more more than research, maybe, to astronomers. <laughs> um, all right. Um, Kevin, do you want to say something, for example? Do you have any um, specific stories? Yeah, sure. I don't really have the typical story because as a kid, I, I never really looked up at the sky. And I just... <laughs> It was upon just waking up to things in life and grow, having a growing awareness in high school that I began thinking about how did things really work. And fortunately for me, there was an astronomy class offered in high school. And it wasn't very common, actually, in most schools in the U.S. But there was this one teacher, uh, Mr. Gyra, who really just influenced everybody and he does everything around the school but he's also a biology physics astronomy teacher and had been in this um had started this class for 20 years by the time that i had met him and then he entered he let me go to a field like a field trip sort of event uh at harvard smithsonian and that was a year before i could even take the class officially and i just joined the students and was really inspired and then After that, I took the class the year after and really enjoyed uh, what I learned. And I realized at some point that there was um, one m memory that I can recall. We looked at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which was a, is a classic image of pointing Hubble to a very specific point in the, in the sky and just letting Hubble expose that light for a long time. And what it revealed was that every single point was a, was a galaxy. So my question was, is that, for instance, a picture of us? Like, the, is that a picture of the Milky Way just in the past? And my teacher couldn't really precisely answer that at, in the moment. And I just, you know, I just felt like there was so much to be, to lear to be learned in, in general. So I just decided to commit to this path. And then when the math got difficult, of course, you have to really commit. <laughs> I also like to travel it's, a lot, and this ha was a nice opportunity to do so. It's good that you endured all the math to be where you are now and do some really nice research. Okay, um, Mut, how has it been for you? Yes, uh, so for me it was also when I was quite young, around 15, I think, I was reading those uh, science magazines for children or teenagers, I would say, where there is like all sorts of science, biology, everything. They feature each month like uh, something on a different scientific topic. And um, one of the first books uh, I read like that of the first magazine, uh, they had an astrophysic uh, category where they were speaking about gravitational waves. And at that time, it wasn't observed yet. It was still a theory, but um, I read it and they were explaining the way like uh, objects that are massive, that are dense, uh, deform uh, space time. And uh, I thought that was beautiful, the way you could explain something that is so far away in a way I would have never imagined. And at that time, I didn't even know that was general relativity or anything like that. And I just thought, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, I continue reading this, uh, those uh, magazine and uh, especially the astronomy part. And I discover about all those incredible events that occur in astronomy, some of the most violent events, uh, you know, our, our universe and some of the most powerful. And I found that was just mind blowing. Um, and being able to explain them, to try to understand them, to study them, I find that really interesting. And I feel like because astronomy study those extreme events, it's really like we are at the, the border of uh, human knowledge. And that's something I find really, really interesting and fascinating about it. So, yeah, that's why I choose to do that in the end. That's a good way to think about it, where, really. right, extending a bit the border of human knowledge while we are doing research. Okay. So, Sven, how uh, have you come to astronomy? Uh, yeah, my way was also a bit different. Uh, well, I did look at the stories as a kid, and I did actually also own a like very little telescope, but I didn't really plan to be an astronomer at that time. 
Uh, I studied math after school. Um, and then in the end of my studies, I thought about what I want to be when I like, yeah, grew up. Um, and I applied to a young graduate trainee program at ESA. But they didn't accept me. And I talked to one ESA employee and they said, like, yeah, math isn't really an essential skill for, for ESA. But I kind of had my head set on, I want to work at ESA. So I thought, what would be a good thing? So I thought, huh, yeah, astrophysics might be nice, but now I like it so much that I don't want to go back to ESA. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's basically my story. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yes, so uh, I'm glad that you, you liked it that much. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> uh, how about you, Lila? Yeah, so I was different. I always wanted to do astronomy and learn about the stars and the universe. And um, it's not because I looked at the stars at, as a child, uh, because um, I come from Ludwigshafen. Those of you in Germany might know it as not being the most, you know, pretty city and you cannot really see the stars from the ground. Um, but there is a planetarium there or near there in Mannheim. And my parents always went to her with me as a child and I loved it so much because they would they would tell you what the stars are called and they would tell you the stories of the different uh, constellations and all the Greek myths that go with it. And I was so fascinated by them. And then they also showed all those beautiful pictures of galaxies. And I always wanted to understand what they are where they come from and how you get all those pretty pictures. So I asked the people at the planetarium, I asked my parents and after a while my parents couldn't really answer anymore. And the answer was, yeah, you need to study physics to understand that. <laughs> so yeah, I studied physics in school. I did a lot of math in school and um, yeah, I ended up actually being an astronomer and Unfortunately, being an astronomer doesn't mean that you get to look at all the pretty pictures all the time. Most of the time you're looking at the computer screen and you're writing code or hoping that your code works. Uh, but in the end, you actually get to understand what those pictures mean. And I think that's even more meaningful. So I'm really glad that I yeah, went this path and actually do astronomy right now. So your parent, parents and your thirst for knowledge yes, brought you here, basically. basically. Yeah, my, my curiosity yeah. and the fact that I cannot stop asking questions. <laughs> that's, that's probably the, the case for many of us. So um, actually, actually for me, um, was also maybe not this romantic look at the night sky because I am actually from this area, from from Bonn. And also the night sky is not as nicely visible as maybe somewhere else. Um, but for example, uh, I remember that I was uh, visiting the, the Effetsberg telescope uh, when I was a child. So that was um, because it was quite close and I already developed an interest in astronomy and like reading a lot of books about it, basically already knowing what I would be some at some point. And so far it, uh, It worked, but this uh, this visit also really um, amazed me because this this really large telescope. I mean, it's it's really it's a hundred meter in diameter, and basically it's one of the. I'm not sure. Maybe at that point it was still the largest stereable radio telescope. It was uh, yeah. before. Maybe it was before the Green Bank Telescope, which is slightly bigger in the US, was built. And yeah, that really amazed me, and it's nice that I can nowadays work with exactly this data taken at this telescope. Um, all right, so now you maybe know the, the team a bit better and, and what drives us uh, during each day going to work or at this time stay at home and do our work. Um, and we have a few, a few more things that uh, might be interesting. So for example, Uh, our favorite discoveries that were made in astronomy. I mean, astronomy is uh, is quite old, so there are a lot of things which were already discovered, which does not mean that there are not many things still to discover. But um, we want to talk about what are our favorite discoveries. 
So uh, I can I can start that one off. I think yeah. that the uh, the cosmic microwave background in 1965 was one of the biggest discoveries because, well, from that we based everything that we know now because we realized that we're in a cosmic oven that right now is at three Kelvin in temperature, a uh, hundred times less than room temperature, but at some point, based on our knowledge from other things, we know that there was this background temperature that wasn't three Kelvin, that was millions of Kelvin. And, uh, you know, it goes back to the Big Bang. And then if you look at the microwave background, there's so much that you can pick out from just our, what we are, the single universe that we're given. You know, this is the observable universe and our, our furthest point. But the discovery in and of itself is my favorite because of how it was discovered. You know, they thought yeah, that it was, nice. Sorry. they had, you know, just trying to remove this excess antenna radiation, even tried to scrape off bird shit and just like, they, they couldn't remove this background. And that's because it's a cosmic background in the microwave nowadays wavelengths. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's a really nice discovery and also a nice story. That they wanted to get rid of it, but couldn't because you can't fool nature. <laughs> it it will still be there. <laughs> That's really a pretty big discovery. Uh, and everyone else that has something specific in mind that maybe changed the course of uh, astronomy or maybe even history. I don't know if it changed the course of history, probably not, but my favorite discovery is definitely uh, more recent. It's the discovery of gravitational waves, because it's basically the first time that we're observing something that is not photons. Um, and it's like a whole new area of, of astronomy, basically, which with, with almost endless possibilities. And also, I'm super amazed by how they managed to do that, that they somehow measure this this shift that is, I don't know, one fortieth of a diameter of a proton or something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, but they yeah. measure incredibly okay. small changes in distance over several kilometers, and it's it's just amazing how they did that. Yeah, it's fascinating, I mean the... and uh, it also links to finding gold in universe. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite <laughs> discovery, <laughs> as I mentioned before, from the uh, collision of uh, two neutron stars. So when they collide, they, of course, produce gravitational waves during their dance. So they dance around each other, and the faster they go, the faster the gravitational wave that travels and changes time space, and it changes also the dimensions of time space. It uh, it stretches it, it pushes it, and this is what it does to the Earth. And with these uh, amazing uh, interferometers, LIGO and Virgo, they managed to detect that. As uh, Sven said, this is in, in such a big detail, such a small difference, and they managed to detect it. It took 100 years from when the general relativity, the theory, um, was proposed to actually detect gravitational waves from uh, an astrophysical uh, source, and uh, it's fascinating. Uh, and of course, gold. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's try not to exploit all that uh, gold in the universe. <laughs> the one that can make uh, space travel, uh, you know, possible fast, like in a Star Trek kind of thing or Star Wars, maybe they will explore it. <laughs> it's inevitable. <laughs> Let's there's, go, an infamous, go drive there's an infamous non-discovery where they thought that gold was in large quantities in the ocean and they actually sent large teams to go and just take water from the ocean and they thought that they would get rich but it turns out there's such a small little fraction of gold in the ocean that it never worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they made like, some error with uh, like a few orders of magnitude I think when they estimated the gold in the ocean. Yeah, that, that was a pretty funny, sorry. <laughs> and not even astronomy related. <laughs> I was actually thinking of um, the discovery, where it's maybe not one one big thing, but I think uh, in the 1920s, uh, Edwin Hubble was uh, like the main person, behind, but there were also other persons, uh, leading to the, um, the, the fact that we know now that uh, we 
the whole galaxy is not only um, it's not the only one, and that things that we observe on the sky are actually outside of our galaxy and much much farther away than um, than what we initially thought before that, and it's really um, um, how, how to put it. And we also know that the universe expanded. That that uh, probably goes into like a bigger picture that Kevin was also mentioning with the cosmic micro microwave background. Right, that was the first time that we maybe started thinking about okay, what now that the universe became so big and it's expanding, like what is happening here? And then we built slowly built up over decades the picture that we we're having now. So, and I think that's sort of a bit of the ch of the starting point for me. So I think that's. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. For me, I would say, so if I can join also the discussion, so I would yeah, go to, to much earlier. So since I like all this history and so on, so it's probably not one of the most important discoveries in humanity, but one that marked me a lot when I was uh, younger. So it's, so it's 200 more or less before our time when Eratosthenes was measuring the diameter of the Earth. And he was taking the, so he was measuring the shadows that were produced in two cities in, in Egypt, Aswan and Alexandria. And just by knowing the distance between these two cities and the difference in the shadows, he got to know the diameter of the earth with a precision of about 10%, which is pretty good at that time. And I remember when I was younger thinking, how was he measuring the distance between the two points so he, because you cannot put a long meter to measure the distance between two cities. Also, how was he communicating with someone because there were no phones? So how to tell someone, measure now the shadow and I measure the shadow now to see how that they are measured at the same time. So I remember thinking that at that time there were lots of difficulties to do science and the kind of discoveries or findings that they found were really impressive. So I think this, well, to me this would be my discovery, but of course, did not change that much science as we know it nowadays. Well, there was a like um, a sort of science took a break in between a bit, not entirely, right? But uh, you know that it did some. They were, they did pretty well. At there were time. some really dark impressive. dark ages in between, right? So since that time till now, something happened, and then now it has exploded, and it's much faster. There. And let's hope it yes. will not go back to the arcade. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we already talked a bit about about the past, let's let's do like um, a thought experiment where time travel is possible. And if so, if you could talk to or meet any person in in the history, probably so let's say a scientist, <laughs> um, even. Like if they're dead now, let's say time travel is possible, so you could go back in time and meet them. Who would you meet, and like maybe what would you talk to them about? So, so has anyone I thought would, about that? Can I jump in? Of course. Because I uh, just um, in connection to our discussion right now about the ancient Greeks, um, the scientists that I would like to talk to are exactly those scientists from ancient times that we don't know. Uh, we don't really know anymore about because maybe what they've written got lost, maybe um, what they've done did not seem remarkable for other people and therefore we don't know about them anymore. And I would really be curious at what kind of knowledge they had, what kind of knowledge has been lost. Um, maybe knowledge has been found again, but in the end I would be so curious to see what those people that we don't know about really have to say. I fully agree with that. So how, how they were thinking. So I was thinking now a name of one of these uh, philosophers, let's say, that it's Aristarchus, uh, that he was essentially the first one or one of the first ones who proposed heliocentrism, so that the sun was at the center and not the earth was at the center. And somehow this idea was not maintained over time or not really supported because there were no evidences until Copernicus. So like 1500 years later. But I would like to, to talk to these people to, to see how they were thinking and how some of them reached this conclusion. So what, what was the way they were connecting all the impressions that they had from nature? So that, that would be a good time for me to go, to travel. 
Yeah, for me too, it would be something from ancient uh, uh, times, a bit later than um, uh, Aristarchos, who was from Samos. Aristarchos, the Aristarchos Osamios, we say in Greece. So he was. Uh, I like your pronunciation much better you. than mine. So. Thank you. It's, uh, it's all this Greek all my life. <laughs> uh, but he was like three, uh, 300 uh, before Christ, okay, astronomer, mathematician. Uh, but I would go a bit after Christ uh, uh, and, uh, and go and find uh, Ipatia who lived in Alexandria, who was born and died in Alexandria of Egypt. And she was a philosopher, astronomer and mathematician. She was the first uh, female mathematician. She recorded and wrote text uh, and some of it is, uh, uh, we still have it today. Of course, most of the things are lost, as uh, Lila said. So it would be very nice to talk to these people, understand uh, their how they thought about nature and how, because they would combine many sciences, uh, philosophy, mathematics, uh, physics, uh, and today we don't do that, we split them. Uh, so at that time, they would combine many sciences uh, and uh, under, to understand better nature around us. And f specific for Hippatia, I would, uh, it's very interesting for me to, talk to her because she she was murdered because um, of her beliefs, because of uh, different religions. So uh, I wanted to understand her way of thinking and uh, it's like a social experiment in my brain, not only uh, to understand how she thought as a scientist, but what was different for her and the people that murdered her because of uh, different science. Um, religious beliefs. So, more difficult times. So, I, I'm, yes. I'm glad that uh, we are free to do research now, but it yeah, would be interesting to see how, how that actually was for the people back then. Um, all right. Does uh, someone else have like a uh, specific scientist they Just a, a very quick one. Uh, Richard Feynman played the bongos, and <laughs> I play the bongos. So, <laughs> and random other drums. So it would be cool, not even just to have a conversation, but to just have a musical conversation with Richard Feynman and play yeah. the drums with him. <laughs> yeah, if I can also jump in very quickly. Um, uh, if I could meet someone, I would love to meet uh, Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, I think, um, for a very simple reason. Uh, I love uh, the equation, the formalism, Maxwell equation, and everything that you apply to electromagnetism, uh, fluid mechanics. I think it's one of the most beautiful formalism in physics and mathematics, and you can also generalize it to uh, relativity and so on, and I just find that amazing. So... Yeah, uh, I would meet him and just say, wow, how did he do that? That's incredible. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah, just to congratulate him, basically. <laughs> I think if I may jump in also, I would take a slightly different approach. I would probably visit scientists like Boltzmann, who had a theory that was not accepted by the scientific community, and he actually killed himself one year before his theory was proven correct. So I could maybe tell him, hang in one more year, like <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and That's yeah, a really good thought. Yeah. So who, who knows what, what he might uh, have done if he uh, was to be alive longer, right? Same, same with uh, Einstein. Like in one year, he revolutionized two fields of physics. And then for 10 years, he tried to disprove quantum mechanics. So if he had worked those 10 years on something else. <laughs> <laughs> so take him uh, off this obsession, eh? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think he was a really interesting person. I would actually uh, uh, like to, to meet him. Then I, I, I think actually he's also the one uh, who is assigned the most uh, false quotes. So I could have asked him what he actually said and what he didn't. 
but only no, if he can actually remember. <laughs> if he if he can remember, yes, that's that's true. But uh, probably at that time everything was. Um, I assume he did. So <laughs> I think he was also a very interesting and peculiar personality. As, like um, aside from science. And maybe he could uh, explain GR to me in some way <laughs> that I don't understand. <laughs> that would be a really a nice thing. Um, all right, it's um, let's go back to, uh, to the present. And right by presently, we are like you can see all sitting at home, not only for uh, the our live video podcast, but uh, also because we're working from home. So uh, if you wonder how that um, home office and the current situation around the uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, affects us, um, yeah, we want to talk about uh, that a bit. For example, uh, Alvaro, how, how is that for you? So I could say that, so it's a bit annoying that you have to stay home. But since I'm an observer, so I'm used to stay in remote places alone and interacting with people. Um, but yeah, so regarding work, since most of the things that we are doing are with the computer, somehow it's it's okay because I can do the same things here to those that I was doing in the office with the difference that my internet connection is not so great. So then the speed can <laughs> be a bit slower. And then, so luckily nowadays, I think we have many tools to communicate with people that are distant. And then we can continue having these meetings that I was mentioning in the beginning, that it's where we trigger discussions or we have ideas of what to do next. So we can, we can continue having them. So I'm quite happy about this. But of course, so what it's missing is more this social interaction. Sometimes just drinking a coffee, you have lots of ideas and now you cannot have it, right? Yes. Unless you have virtual coffee, so at eleven That's o'clock right. you zoom with your uh, <laughs> with your colleagues and you have a coffee for like ten fifteen minutes, and I, I dr- ideas uh, come through. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this, this casual coffee with colleagues in the kitchen area. That's uh, that's what I really miss too. <laughs> How are you feeling this situation? Because maybe for you guys, most of you are PhD students. So do you see it really different or working from home compared to working from the office? Well, normally my supervisor is uh, more or less next doors. So uh, in case he's not on traveling or so, I can always like see him. And if he's not too busy and ask him something that's on my mind or just asking any colleague for if I have a question like, or how do you use that software that I have never used? Or uh, maybe you have a scientific question that you won't have answered. Like, that's, that's a bit more difficult to do. Like, you just don't call the, the people <laughs> like that when you're, compared to when you just casually walk to their offices. Yeah, that, that's, um, I don't know how it's, how it's for the other people who are students. Um, I think, uh, I, the contact to the, my supervisor is a bit less. I'm, I'm still contacting him by Zoom meetings or so, but it's uh, of course not as frequent or as frequent as it could be if we weren't to stay home. Yeah, also a supervisor can better like ignore you. I don't mean it in a bad way, but sometimes uh, <laughs> when you want to really to talk to your supervisor and it has to be right now, sometimes you can just catch them in their office and go to their office but you know if they're not in their offices and you need to write them an email to actually contact them then it's easier for them to say okay i don't have any time today i have stuff to do so i feel like i'm also having less contact with my supervisor right now Uh, but on the other hand i think we're all pretty fortunate in that we can actually work from home because i can do all my work remotely um and I don't know how it is with you guys, if you really need stuff that is in, in, in the institute or the computers in the institute, but I think we can all access them pretty well remotely. So we're quite fortunate in, in that respect, I think, compared to 
to other people working other jobs where they really cannot work from home. Yes, that is a problem yeah. indeed. And uh, supervisors also usually are older, so they have other responsibilities like families, homeschooling, which is now a big problem because most of the schools have dropped all the educational uh, ways on the parents. So just loads of homework and that's it. The kid has to do it. So imagine your supervisor trying to balance the situation very fast. So it's for everyone is a, is a time of uh, adaptation. You know, we try to adapt to new situations. As you said, we are the ones that are more accustomed to it because because of our way of uh, work, we are used to working alone. We are used to working in our personal laptops at home. We can access our work uh, computers. The, there is this possibility. Uh, we can talk to our um, colleagues via Zoom, via Skype. Uh, but astronomy is not only that, is uh, is the connection that uh, we are missing. This is why we meet in conferences, uh, because of the social interaction that uh, somehow improves brainstorming. I don't know how it does it, but it happens. It improves collaborations because collaborations are not only these Zoom meetings. You you spend time with other person, you have dinner, uh, you have a casual discussion, you talk about uh, science also. And uh, it's, it's more casual uh, and you can form a better collaboration than when you do it virtually. I, I, I totally believe that. And I think this is going to have a very big impact uh, on astronomy. Uh, I hope it's for a short time. Uh, and because people try to balance too many things at the same time. There is not much time anymore. Uh, if you don't have a family and you're alone at home, there, there is a lot of time, but still you might not be productive because there is a lot to comprehend. So that's a big problem. It's also an emotional, a psychological problem. Uh, and on the other hand, if you have too many things to balance, it's also an emotional problem because you don't have enough time. You don't know where to give more weight. So I think we are all trying to do the best under very difficult circumstances. Uh, and first of all, we should take care of our mental health, uh, talk to our friends, uh, to our family, and uh, try to take care of ourselves more. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, help uh, videos uh, available uh, to help us go through this uh, difficult situation through approved techniques from psychologists, not random YouTube videos. Uh, so... If you need links, I, I can happily provide from uh, trained psychologists. You can so, start becoming friends and talking to your spiders. Is this what you do? I don't have spiders, I clean. A couple times a week, talk to them. But they're useful have, um, to get rid of mosquitoes or flies. Or... <laughs> I keep them as pet. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, this op offers an opportunity uh, to stop and breathe. And at least for me, I've been traveling a lot throughout my PhD. And fortunately, I didn't have any travels planned that I had booked or anything. So I, I lucked out in that sense. Um, but I've just been reflecting a lot and taking this time to kind of start from scratch in, on some level in, in many different areas of my work. Yes. I mean, I think there's, you actually have a lot of time to think and you, you should probably also like uh, take take that time to do that and maybe consider, um, like Eleni said, consider your, your mental health. And you know, is that teaching is, at least for us students, it's good that teaching at the university has been suspended for a couple of weeks. So this also gives some extra time. That's and good. yeah, it's. I think it's still unclear how it's going to start at the end of April, but uh, I feel like it's really good. There's no teaching right now. 
you know, you can use this time also to watch uh, astronomy on top bone videos from past events, <laughs> uh, which talk good to you talk. about the universe in a very simple way. Uh, so it's very good time, you know, not only Netflix, there is also astronomy on top bone. <laughs> so subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> you can find all the, uh, I think more or less all the talks so, so far there. So there, uh, there have been a lot. Yes, we are oh. on season two, right? So towards the end of season two. So a lot of videos to watch different subjects, very interesting. So maybe that's a solution for the mental uh, health, uh, you know, taking care of your mental health, watch uh, astronomy and tap videos. <laughs> That's a really good suggestion for our viewers. <laughs> but let's just hope that uh, everything will be cleared up as soon as possible and that we be able to move on. Um, let's just sort of talk about something maybe a bit, uh, a bit related about uh, academia in general, how, uh, how we like, work and live in it and um, how the working environment is in general. I think uh, now we see that uh, some things are generally good. If we, for example, can can work from home. <laughs> but uh, like more, more in general, like uh, what do you think about uh, working in, in academia? Do, do you like it? Uh, is there think, some things that could be improved? I think that there's um, a disconnect with our lives as human beings and our and us being viewed as statistics and number crunchers and just simply doing science just to follow rules and develop and do research but not really thinking outside of the box of how that impacts or how that impacts other lives or how that impacts our own lives and those around us and how we can use our understanding of our own life and those of those around us to then influence and inspire our own science. And so I think working in academia right now is, is really, uh, there's a lot growing in terms of technology. There's a lot growing in terms of interdisciplinary sciences. But um, if you think of what Alvaro had said in terms of theory and observations, uh, there's always this more practical aspect, hands-on experimental observation side of things. And then there's this theory that develops the motivation to do the observations. And I think that we, although theory is intangible, still give as much credit to the theory as we do to tangible observational science. And in a similar sense, we don't give much credit to the intangible aspects of our emotional or mental or spiritual aspects which influence our science. And we think of it as not on the same pedestal. So on some sense, it's more abstract. It's, you know, telling me how to live my life. It's, you know, what does intuition have to do with writing this code? You know, things like this. And the, I think the attitude um, is starting to shift. But that is one of the challenges working in academia as we start to evolve as human beings doing science in only 200 years after science really kicked off. So we were realizing that our human life itself and how we view it in relation to the science that we do is more is just as important as the output of the science. But that's a challenge right now. I believe right that's at the forefront. Yeah, I think that I think that's true. And uh, like, uh, I mean, we we all told told our stories about like how we came into astronomy, but like keep keeping up like this uh, this very early fascination for for a very long time. And I think it's not um, like say it's um, it's not always there necessarily. Like, sometimes you might sit in front of your your code for for days or weeks, like uh, and you're like losing. The, uh, the connection to what that actually does for you in uh, terms of science and like what you originally thought, what you wanted to explore. So having this uh, connection 
that also leads like to the interconnection between theory and observations that was mentioned. I think yes, that, that's that's very important. And uh, I, don't, I don't I don't want uh, don't want to um, uh, basically too much about astronomy and tab one, but I think what we do here is especially important. Also for us, I hope that you also enjoyed uh, as viewers. But uh, for us, it's also important to um, to also see for ourselves uh, the bigger picture that we are in. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Often we are just so concentrated on our own little piece of work, which is just a subtopic of a subtopic of a subtopic, maybe. Then. I really think it's for me also fascinating to watch all the talks by people working on something completely different than what I'm doing and uh, I, I really enjoy that and I think we all need to sometimes be reminded of all the other parts of astronomy that are just as fascinating as the things that we are working on right now. Yeah, I totally agree. And what, one of those advantages of having all those talks, all those group meetings and conferences is really like learning something new. I think for all of us, we will agree on the fact that pretty much every day we learn something new. And I think we are really fortunate for that because there is probably not a lot of work where you can basically, you're being paid to learn and and understand and spend time on uh, re getting really deep into a subject and uh, that's something uh, I really like about uh, working in academia. Yeah. <laughs> I think it also kind of speaks for our society that we are able to do it because what we're doing, to be honest, has no value for the everyday life. It's just because we want to know it because I it's, disagree. It's something <laughs> okay. But I will tell you later. <laughs> okay, L let me rephrase. It has no practical value for everyday life. I, I disagree. Uh, yes. I have okay. examples. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Okay, there might be some counter examples, but I can confidently tell you that what I'm doing will have no impact on anyone's life that is not working in astronomy. Um, maybe in the future. <laughs> maybe. But uh, the, the thing that we are able to research things because we think they're interesting and because we want to know them, I think, speaks also for, for us as a society. Um, because I think yes. that's also how, how we grow, basically. Sorry for interrupting you. It was very... No, it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I, I, I know you, uh, you have... Uh, I'm very passionate about this examples. specific uh, <laughs> topic. I'm sorry I interrupted you. That was extremely rude. I, no, no it's worries. my passion for this topic because it's a common misunderstanding even of astronomers that astronomy does not give anything back and it's not useful to everyday life. We're changing subject, but it's important because the applications of astronomy and uh, what has been developed so far improve our everyday lives. I will give you an example. Uh, for dinner, I cooked on a ceramic kitchen the material, Ceran, was created for, uh, as a substrate for space telescopes by a German um, company, uh, Scott, uh, in the 1970s. So, uh, space telescopes, uh, the mirror does not change, you know, the surface of the mirror does not change from the differences of temperature from, you know, when it looks at the sun and when it looks away, so we can take good observations. But this material was so good that they used it to make kitchens, and now we cook on them. Wi-Fi was created by uh, uh, astronomers in Australia, okay, and now we're using it to broadcast this uh, live and talk about astronomy. Uh, and so many other applications, uh, and there are articles about this at the International Astronomical Union website. I've also written articles on that. Uh, so astronomy does bring things back to society. Uh, and uh, I think people should stop saying that astronomy is just a science, uh, that, you know, why do we do it? Why should we give money to astronomy if it doesn't benefit us? You know, medicine is very important and we have seen how important it is during this pandemic. But uh, 
through the developments of astronomy, we have uh, see, um, um, see cut, uh, scan, no, CAT scans, sorry. Uh, we have CAT scans, we have uh, codes that were used in radio astronomy that are applied for medicine and so many other applications that could not have happened if an astronomer didn't want to understand why this star is brighter than the other star, for example. But this okay. argument doesn't really yeah. apply to everyone working on the theory side. Yeah, that I, 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 that I, I, theory will have an yeah. application, but we do it regardless yeah. because we want to understand. Mm -hmm. But it's a link. But it's a link. If you don't write the theory, then you ca we cannot do the observations yeah, and compare true. them. And what Alvaro, if you want to jump in, what Alvaro was saying before that he's comparing observation and theory. If you don't have the theory and if you don't develop the same things together, it will not happen. And uh, you need the theoretical part too. For example, Wi-Fi, uh, how to write all the equations. Uh, for that and the part. Okay, then, then let me yeah. just say that it's not our intention to do these things. These are yeah, more byproducts of what we do. I, I don't try to do something that will better the lives of people. I try to understand the matter content of the universe, basically. And there might be something as a byproduct that also contributes to society, but it's not my goal, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you. That's, that's more what I meant. Maybe uh, I, I phrased that wrong. Yeah. yeah, I just want to do a very quick comment. Uh, theory do sometimes bring something very practical to people. It's not often. It's of course not the the main objective part, but one of the very famous application of uh, special relativity is GPS. We will not have any GPS without special relativity, and that's hardcore theory right there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> sometimes it does happen, but I do agree with you. Uh, it's uh, not all the theory and it's uh, a byproduct. That's absolutely true, yes. I think in conclusion, we could say that more money should be spent on astronomy. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Give us money. <laughs> there, we all agree about that. We all find astronomy very exciting. So, uh, in the end, uh, you will pay us somehow by a tax money that you pay, which pays us. And if I can <laughs> also add to what uh, Maud said about the GPS, it's on, uh, not only the equations and the theory behind it, it's also the applications or radio telescopes, the VLBI network, the very, help me, how does it spell out, uh, Felix, the VLBI? very long baseline interferometry, right? Correct. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so it's this network that helps GPS stay there and we, we can keep track of our um, movements. Um, okay. Yeah. Do we so have uh, more questions? I think, we're, um, I think we had some more questions. But yeah. we are, it's, it's taking quite a long time now, right? So maybe but we should... Uh, let's do the last one that is exciting. All right. Um, I mean, yeah, we talked about um, earlier about some dis uh, discoveries that we thought were very interesting. But there, of course, there will be some future discoveries. And uh, the question, what, what do you think is like the next big discovery? There are many, many things to discover, to be discovered. But what could be the next big thing? I think maybe the modified gravity, the fact that gravity might change with time, might be the biggest, ne the next biggest discovery. But I think it'll be such a discovery where it doesn't, it can't obviously change our understanding from how we know it now because so many tests have been verified. Uh, but on some level, it might help resolve some discrepancies, but fill in some blanks. I'll say the thing that I find the most exciting, and that would be space travel. I really want to have space travel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I want people to go to Mars and beyond. <laughs> yeah, you wrote that article about uh, space uh, sailing ships, right? That it was really interesting. Yes, so there are some some 
people working on ways to actually have interstellar travel, which is quite difficult to have with a usual rocket because you need a lot of fuel and if you have a lot of fuel then the rocket will get really heavy and you need even more fuel to accelerate it. So the idea is that you have actually um, a sail. So the sail will then be propelled by photons, so from light, and this will propel the ship forward and you can actually get really really fast and have interstellar travel. So that would be really exciting if, if that would work. I can do that. I, I sorry, I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the best. Also, there's this old project Orion that was researched by NASA at some point, where it's basically you build a giant spaceship and set off nukes behind it, um, and that would be a win-win in my opinion because we would get rid of all the nukes. I mean, we can destroy our planet like forty times over. Why do we need that? And we would have interstellar travel. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> I don't want to be on that spaceship, though. <laughs> It'll definitely lighten up the sky for a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we will survive. <laughs> yeah, better, better like, get far, uh, far away first and then start with the new king. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I haven't really researched it, but apparently they, they have this develop some kind of shielding that would actually like make it possible to live on the ship but I don't know too much about that. Um, yeah. yeah, if I can jump in very quickly, I personally think one of the big discovery that will happen in the future would be to clarify what is dark energy because that's the main component of our universe, 70%. And that could be one of the explanation of what the universe is in accelerated expansion. So that would be really uh, game changing, I guess. And the second big thing would be dark matter, which is the second biggest component. And those two things are totally unknown uh, and not very well understood. So I think that could be a very big discovery also, yes. Yes, def definitely. We've been in the in the dark about the dark energy, <laughs> pun intended, uh, for a long time now. <laughs> so it would be really great to ha to have that resolved at some point. <laughs> How about yeah, life? I mean, yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. I think um, uh, I think we had some uh, inspiration from the live chat that said discovery a great discovery would be uh, alien life uh, uh, exactly that would be um, a really great discovery um, I, I don't know like how um, exactly would find we we'll find life I mean it could be that we find some life forms on Mars some some hidden uh, underground uh, seas or something like that we find some bacteria or so it could be like something that uh, that simple um, or we could be uh, overrun by some alien civilization tomorrow like uh, it uh, <laughs> they are very very much different scales on uh, how we could discover them or uh, encounter them I think that the most probable thing would, would probably be like finding life on some on Mars or in some asteroid or so to this point so we could think what is life right so we don't, yeah. we don't have a good definition of life so i'm i was reading some books last semester just preparing some lectures and i like what the author of that book presented because he was saying we're in an epoch that we are trying to define what is life without having all the tools to understand what is life and he was saying imagine that you go to the 1500 so when Galileo or so, and you ask any of those persons, what is water? So now we know that water is H2O, because we know that there are atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. But at that time, they could not define water like this. So maybe yes. we are in a stage in which, so maybe we have already found life somewhere else, but we cannot recognize it, because it's not the life that we understand. So I think we need to understand what is life first. I could be also like, uh, is there something that are very similar to our definition of life, but not quite? 
take the coronavirus that we're having now, for example. I mean, they're not exactly life forms, but it's also hard to say they they are really not, right? Because they have uh, RNA. They, they, they many many of the things that we like uh, would uh, say are um, very um, much lifelike uh, are the case for for viruses. But there are some some other things um, that uh, where they don't fall into that definition, and but they're not life. But if we would discover some virus on uh, on Mars, that would be a pretty big thing, right? So, and then would we say we didn't discover life? Yeah, it's, uh, maybe maybe we will also change our definition of that based on what we find. But I think also we're looking for intelligent life in the sense that they can produce telecommunications. And that's why the SETI project is looking at the radio frequencies to see if there are any signals coming from space that might be uh, made in the same way we make signals through our radios, televisions, all these electronics. Uh, but... Maybe in the future we will be able to uh, detect something like that. This has not happened as yet. Yes. So that, that would be a really great thing. Maybe we can like uh, make some connections with uh, some exoplanet that we find at some point, which we think might harbor life. There could be a connection there. And I think the uh, exoplanet science is really exploding. So I think we will find a lot more of them in the future. For me also would be a very nice, sorry if I, I talk a lot, but uh, for me it would be very exciting to uh, find, the, to detect, to be able to detect the gravitational waves from the, when the universe was created. So before the cosmic microwave background radiation. So there is a point in time before that we cannot observe with our telescopes because there was no light. We cannot see it with our current telescopes. So one of the methods to to understand what was happening before is to detect gravitational waves that came from the this ex, you know the big bang, the current theory we believe how the universe was created. So for me that would be very exciting, and maybe uh, someone on the theoretical part can comment more on that. Maybe like. Are the current um, uh, like, uh, forms like LIGO or so, are, are they, I think they're not capable of uh, observing that, right? I don't know if it would be possible with uh, this, um, the SLISA, which is like the, the space laser interferometer for detecting gravitational waves. I don't know if that maybe will be able to detect. I don't know if it has the, the capability. Uh, so at the moment, LIGO and the two LIGO and Virgo can detect uh, uh, collisions, gravitational waves from collisions, supermassive black holes and neutron stars uh, of small masses, uh, solar masses, uh, 20 solar masses, uh, around that range, uh, up to 80, uh, I think, 20, 40, 40 solar masses. But then uh, LISA will be able to detect uh, gravitational waves from collision of uh, um, supermassive black holes, which uh, so these are uh, in the center of galaxies, um, but I I'm not aware for gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe. I think it's it's also a frequency problem because basically you you cannot detect waves that are outside a certain frequency range, and as far as I know, a very good hope to also detect these gravitational waves are these pulsar timing arrays, where you observe pulsars that are like really, really precise clocks. And from the time between the pulses, you can sometimes also try to detect gravitational waves. But as far as I know, I'm really not an expert in this. This is like all in, in, in baby shoes still, and like yeah, still an being, being developed. I'm not an expert on it either, but I think um, the gravitational waves that you have from the Big Bang um, uh, they are. They have really, really long wavelengths. So with pulsar timing, you could detect them because um, they can basically detect really low frequency uh, gravitational waves. So also those that have really long wavelengths. But if you want to detect them with a gravitational wave detector, you would need a really large detector. So that's why LIGO cannot do that. 
I'm not sure if Lysa, so the one in space, would be able to detect it, but I doubt it, actually. I think it's not the main purpose that it's built for. But I mean, we can um, we can hope for the future that we are will be able to build an instrument. Maybe maybe there will be some instrument that we cannot think of right now that will be able to do it, right? That yeah. would definitely be uh, very nice to go to the very, very early days of our universe. The the dark ages. <laughs> how that's uh, how we call them. Um, all right, does anyone else have like a, a discovery that they want to talk about, which might happen? I mean, that's yes. Like just to things. conclude, sorry. So probably something that will happen really soon is standardization of quantum computation. And this can speed up all the processing and then this can make it possible all these discoveries that we were talking till now. So maybe quantum computers is the is the future right. to the yeah. future. That could improve like basically on on any level <laughs> and any other science, right? So that yes, is, it will be groundbreaking. That is very important because uh, the next generation telescopes observe a lot of information and uh, this needs to be stored and processed. So current computers, even supercomputers that we're using for very complicated uh, calculations cannot do that. So we need quantum computers to process and store, process all of this information and uh, help us understand uh, so we're talking about a lot of big data, bigger than big data, uh, terabytes of information, for example, the square kilometer array. Uh, so I still remember the early times when I was a PhD student in Oxford and my supervisor, Steve Rawlings, uh, co-wrote the white paper on that. And uh, they were... They were saying that you do need quantum computers to happen in order for SKA, full SKA, to be possible because you have terabytes of information every day, even more. And at the moment, what is happening is you are sacrificing that data and deleting it. Uh, so, and of course, you cannot process fast enough all the information you you're getting. So, I agree with uh, Alvaro 100%. Yeah, when we think about the um, image of the black hole in M87, for example, that was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, um, the technology of VLBI, like very long baseline interferometry, they've been used to do, to do that, where the telescopes are distributed all over the world and we um, connect them basically later by a computer. This technology has been around for like 50 years or so, so we know that it's possible, but it is only um, that we could, so that we had the additional technology of better receivers, better computers that could store and process all the data that we could actually handle these high frequencies and uh, be able to detect that. So technology is definitely a big part there. Um, all right, uh, let us stop here, the discussion. I think it has been very interesting. And uh, I think now we will have uh, another another highlight, which will be a, a slam talk by uh, by Sandra. We cannot hear I, you. I was any... muted. Yes, I understood. Yeah. I it's like in dreams, you know, when you think you are speaking, mm -hmm. but no one can hear you. This happened in reality. <laughs> That's uh, a bad I feeling. was just yeah. Oh, it was the worst. So I was uh, trying to see if we have any more questions from the live chat because we said we will answer the questions from the audience. Do we have uh, some more questions? Uh, I'm waiting for Lila to respond because I don't have li the live chat in front of me. Yeah, I can ask a question. Uh, we okay. had one, so one question earlier. Yes, yeah, so uh, question was if uh, uh, wormholes are possible, yeah. I don't know the answer to this. If anyone knows, um, you um, mean wormholes yes, yes, worm made holes. by uh, made by worms in the ground <laughs> or wormholes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would answer it from a theory perspective and say yes, theoretically wormholes are possible, but they would exist for so short a time and would be so unstable that we could not use them as they do in interstellar. But they, I mean, in principle, they're possible, and the universe is infinite, so 
who knows if they're there, but I doubt it that we will ever find one. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a stone that has yeah. been created by basically some, uh, by the humans from from another time, right? So they knew some technology to do it. I mean, we don't know, right? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we can influence that, but it would be speaking like of a very, very much time in the future. I am so fantastic. Uh, thank you, Felix, for moderating this uh, very interesting session with uh, all this debate. I think we learned a lot of things and uh, it can only generate more questions, for sure. <laughs> this discussion is infinite. <laughs> it's infinite. Uh, we have a special surprise uh, for the German-speaking audience before we close for tonight. Uh, so our team member, Sandra Unruh, which could not be on the live stream today, but she is at home watching us uh, and commenting. And sending, we are sending you our love. Uh, so Sandra made a three-minute science video for the competition Fame Lab that happens every year in different place. But uh, unfortunately, this year was cancelled uh, due to co COVID-19. But the video is here. And it's for you to watch, exclusive now on Astronomy Tab Pond. So Lila will play it for all of us to watch uh, for three minutes and then I'll start talking again. Ich bin Kosmologin und ich werde in den nächsten drei Minuten deine Zukunft vorhersagen. Um dich zu überzeugen, dass ich kein Scharlatan bin, erzähle ich dir erst einmal etwas über deine Vergangenheit. Dafür bräuchte ich dein Gesicht frontal zum Bildschirm. Ja, entspannen. Denn digital ist das Ganze für mich um einiges schwieriger. Los geht's. Ich sehe, alles begann mit dem Urknall. Das Universum war unvorstellbar heiß und klein. Es vergeht ein Bruchteil einer Sekunde und im nächsten Bruchteil wächst das Universum um das 10 hoch 26-fache an. Also so, als würde sich ein Feinstaubkorn auf die Größe des Sonnensystems aufblähen, mal einer Milliarde. Dann löschen sich Materie und Antimaterie aus und es bleibt ein winziges bisschen Materie übrig. Dich zum Beispiel. Der Nachhall des Urknalls, der kosmische Mikrowellenhintergrund, ist bis heute sichtbar. Du kannst ihn dir übrigens nochmal auf einem unbelegten Kanal auf Omas altem Röhrenfernseher anschauen. Es folgen 13,3 Milliarden relativ unspektakuläre Jahre, bis dann vor wenigen Jahrzehnten du als eine Materieansammlung mit Bewusstsein auf der Erde erschien. Das sollte jetzt jedem deiner Atome bekannt vorkommen und ich hoffe, ich konnte dich mit dieser Geschichte deiner Vergangenheit überzeugen, dass ich weiß, wovon ich rede. Aber nun zu dem, was du noch nicht weißt. Deine Zukunft und damit auch die Zukunft des ganzen Universums. Um die Zukunft zu verstehen, muss ich mich mit den Energien im Universum auseinandersetzen. Es gibt die Energie der Materie, also zum Beispiel deiner Materie, dann die Energie der dunklen Materie, die Energie der Strahlung und schließlich die immer stärker werdende dunkle Energie. Wäre um dich herum dunkle Energie statt unserer Erde und Atmosphäre, würde folgendes passieren. Du hast diesen Apfel und du wirfst ihn hoch. Anstatt, dass der Apfel zu dir zurückkehrt, fliegt er weiter hoch und zwar schneller und schneller. Und das passiert im Moment im gesamten Universum. Es dehnt sich aus, schneller und schneller. Irgendwann zerreißt es dann auch Galaxien, Sterne, Planeten und schließlich selbst Atome. Das Universum ist dann ohne Materie, ohne dich, es wird kalt sein, es wird dunkel sein und das wollte ich dir sagen. Tut mir leid, dass ich keine besseren Nachrichten für dich habe. Ich schaue mir aber nochmal die Verteilung der Galaxien genau an und in den nächsten Jahren werde ich davon mehrere 10 Milliarden zur Verfügung haben und dann bekommst du nochmal ein Update. I hope you liked that. 
If you want to watch it again, it's going to be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, this is our live for today. Uh, we had a great time being with you from our houses. Now you know how our living rooms look like. Uh, at the end, you can vote for the living room you like the most. Okay. Uh, and then we can all fight with each other. <laughs> Who has the best living room? Uh, I would like uh, first. So guys, please unmute uh, all of your mics. I would like to thank first uh, Alvaro, of course, our special guest for being here with us. Alvaro, thank you very much. Uh, we had a fantastic time hosting you at Astronomy on Tap Bone and we learned so, so many things. And I have more questions now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to all you guys. And thanks for making it possible that you are approaching science to the society. So this is a really nice work, what you're doing. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you to all the team. I thank you to Kevin, Sven, Maud, Felix, who am I missing, uh, for the panel discussion, Felix, for moderating the second uh, uh, part. Thank you very much uh, for all the useful uh, ideas and contributions. And uh, we could be talking for hours, guys, literally. We can, we can talk for hours, believe us. Lila? Yeah, could have done that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, we just need more beer. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is I'm, I'm running out of beer. Uh, yes, I mean, they have to finish at home. Uh, uh, we did talk for hours, it's true. Uh, okay, Sh don't say everything. <laughs> for more hours, more than uh, two, three. Okay, so, uh, okay, I need to thank uh, Lila. We all need to thank Lila because all the technical part, all the little details, everything that ran smoothly today took a lot of planning, took Three weeks of technical planning and testing that uh, Lila uh, initiated and she made all this nice uh, uh, design for you to watch us uh, through, you know, on, uh, on Skype. So a big, a big thank you for Lila and uh, for, for running this live tonight. Uh, thank you to the team, the, the whole team for, who took action early enough. Uh, because we saw what was happening with coronavirus, we had the meeting very early on, we cancelled the event uh, on time uh, when the restrictions on public life happened and uh, we were one of the first Astronomy on Tap events to go virtual, so we keep bringing astronomy to the general public. Uh, and we don't lose contact with you, you don't lose contact with us. And this is a different format. We don't have the quiz, unfortunately, which we really enjoy. Um, maybe in a future event, uh, we manage to do something for that. We will see, we will brainstorm. Uh, I hope, we hope you liked it. Before uh, we finish, I would like to uh, say that we really hope we are at Fiddler's again very soon, and this is over. Until then, uh, everyone should stay safe. Our next event in April, uh, in case that we cannot uh, resume our social lives as yet, will be again a vodcast, a live vodcast. This is on the 28th of April at 7 p.m. again, here live on YouTube. And we have Dr. Uh, Reinhard, Reinhard Keller, uh, from Max Planck talking us about Effelsberg Radio Telescope, which is located south of Bonn. It's a very big, it's a 100 meter diameter radio telescope. It's fantastic. And if you haven't visited now, no, it's not the time, <laughs> but uh, maybe sometime in the future. Uh, so you can see it uh, uh, virtually next month. Um, and we will have Dr. Alan Roy, again from Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, with a sonification of data, radio data, from the VLBI, the very long baseline interferometry. So he takes the signal from radio observations and makes music out of it. Okay, so he will play the song of that. Uh, uh, and if we manage to make a pub event, we will also have Maud uh, talking to us about the AZ effect, right? Uh, yeah. Maud. Uh, <laughs> And yeah. uh, what, what in specific about the Z effect? 
just the fact that we can see and understand the universe through this effect, that is uh, not a very well-known effect, I guess. <laughs> Whenever people ask me, like, what are you doing? It's always very hard because, you know, if you work on galaxy or stars or even planets, people sort of have an idea of what you're doing. But when you work on an effect like that, that is just uh, photons, CMB photons gaining energy and uh, the spectral shape being distorted, uh, yeah, most of the time people don't know. So I will try to explain in a simple way all of that. Yes. I think uh, that's that's very good to learn something new that uh, we don't know, uh, to understand our universe better. And uh, even if we don't manage to hear a talk from you, maybe we'll have a small discussion on the vodcast. Yes. Yeah, um, pleasure. So, guys, we will resume. Uh, so, we will close this uh, live. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Uh, take care of others. It's not only about us. It's about everyone. And uh, subscribe to our channel <laughs> and watch our videos. They're awesome. And uh, uh, we have been producing them ourselves, uh, uh, Felix and Lila. And Manali have been producing videos. Uh, so thank you very much. Have a good night and see you soon. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Bye.